Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Gary. John, good to see you. I, I know. I, let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> well, we missed you last week, so just, yes. just, so, just so, so you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, um, hey, look, everybody knows uh, we got Sandy Monroe coming on the show. We, there he is. Oh, oh. Got Corey Steuben <laughs> with us as well. So hi, hey. how are you guys? Hey. Yeah, the dynamic duo. <laughs> oh, that's right. So tons of stuff to talk about today. Cool. J- just so the audience knows, some of the stuff I want to get into, I want to hear some of your guys' reactions because you were personally at Tesla's Master Plan Part 3 yeah. down in Austin. This new assembly process, which blew my mind, the $25,000 car, what's it going to take to get a $25,000 look and make a profit on it? That's the key, right? Mm. And then the other thing, this Tesla OS, I'd, I'd love to get your guys' uh, reaction to that. But uh, in right, any right, case, but, but, but first, we got we, everybody knows who Sandy is. Corey, level set us. Who are you? What do you do? So our audience knows you. All right. Yeah, thanks. So I've been at Monroe for 18 years. Sandy hired me as an intern back in 2005. So I've worked my way up all these years. And and I was the one who who pushed Sandy to be on YouTube. And John, I got to hand it to you. I when he every time he went on auto line, I noticed your views were way up 300,000, 700,000. And I said, Sandy, we need to bottle that up and kind of keep a little bit of that for ourselves. So uh, I was there for the first hundred videos for Sandy on YouTube, but I'm the president of Monroe and Associates right now. So um, I've been helping Sandy grow the company over the last two and a half, three years, and we're doing pretty well. So I'm glad to be on. I also have a long history in automotive benchmarking. I've uh, supported Fiat Chrysler automobiles for the better part of a decade for the development of a lot of their platforms. So I have a, a deep understanding of automotive design and, and manufacturing. And, and Sandy, you, of course, are just a YouTube star. That's basically <laughs> just... <laughs> well, I just sit here. <laughs> sit here and act like a star or something. Just just in, just, just influence, just, you know, just oh, by yeah, your yeah, presence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm, good, good. That, that, that makes it easier for me. If I don't want to say anything, I can't make a mistake. <laughs> but uh, no, but Corey, uh, Corey's kind of modest. He's also... Um, he was also big into auto racing. He had a he had to use his cube basically just to store um, trophies. At one time, uh, you could not get into his cube at all, and it was piled from floor to the top of the ceiling uh, with with trophies. And then, <clears throat> what'd you do with those trophies? <laughs> what'd you do with those away. trophies? Every one of them, unbelievable. Wait a minute, and Corey, I didn't know this about you. Wait, 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 what'd you race? Winged sprint cars. All it's right. Familiar. Dirt, dirt yes. track racing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, okay. Next time we get together, we got to talk racing because that's my passion too. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. Well, uh, so anyways, uh, uh, Corey does an awful lot. And one of the things he does way better than I do is remember. So um, <clears throat> if he throws out a number, uh, you, can, uh, you can hang your hat on it. It's correct. So, uh, so that th- there we've, we've preset everything. Now everybody can sit back comfortably. And, um, <laughs> a couple of guys have sent me a little thing that they're, they're going to be having popcorn and beer while they're watching. So, yeah. And probably if there's any, if there's, if there's any of the OEMs, they're probably, <laughs> they're probably going to be taking one of their heart attack pills or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Hey, so let, let's talk about uh, Master Plan Part 3 Day that you guys went down to because I want to get your reaction because the media shrugged, Wall Street yawned. I mean, I I was blown away by the presentation. I mean, I, I've never seen a presentation like that from an automotive company. But Sandy, let's start with you. What, what was your reaction to the whole thing? Corey and I were like uh, little children giggling when they gave us the plant tour. There were so many Easter eggs laying around. There was so much information, information that was ready for the picking that they, uh, there was no press there, I don't think. There was only financial people 
And I mean, the term pearls of swine comes to mind. These guys had no clue what they were looking at, none whatsoever. And like I said, if uh, if you would have been Corey or I, or maybe a, a, you know hundreds or thousands of other engineers, you were on the verge of peeing your pants. It was phenomenal, phenomenal what we got a chance to look at. The dry process for um, making their new battery packs. I mean, we'll probably get into this kind of stuff, but their, their, their new dry process, they showed us up close. They wouldn't let me anywhere near the um, the the presses for making the uh, big castings and whatnot. But um, in fact, the, one guy said, see those four guys over there? They know who you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so, so it wasn't for safety reasons they kept you apart no, from the... No. They, they, they didn't want you guys to see too much up close. They exposed us to a lot of stuff. I thought it was brilliant. It's... Um, without a question of a doubt, the most open, honest um, um, I've ever seen. And it was a wide aisle tour, but I mean, it was it was stunningly uh, populated with um, with everything that if you were an engineer, you'd want to have a look at. Yeah. Yeah. Corey, what was your reaction what, and, and some of your key takeaways? Yeah. So like Sandy mentioned, we interfaced with a lot of traditional investors. So there are people from Fidelity there, people from family funds. So they have a very weak technical background. So Sandy and I actually spent a lot of time explaining to the people on the tour what they were yeah. seeing. It was like we were the tour guides for some of the in institutional investors. And this one woman, Aaron, Aaron Riley, she followed Sandy around like a little puppy the whole time and was just blown away that people knew him. You know, Sandy was being, you know, inundated by people who, who knew him, Tesla employees and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but there was one instance where they stopped <laughs> our tour and, and I noticed that they were doing some testing on an inverter and the form factor of the inverter didn't match any inverter that we've ever benchmarked and we benchmarked every Tesla. So I go, Sandy, Sandy, look. And we were supposed to, we had hard hats on and vests. We weren't supposed to cross the aisle. I just walked across the aisle. I'm like, I don't care. What are they going to do? Kick me out. And I'm looking in this glass test cell. They're doing shear testing on the MOSFETs on how they were mounted, but a completely different form factor, different thermal, uh, uh, thermal cooling strategy. And what I think we were seeing was a new, a new inverter for the next gen powertrain, which they never showed in the presentation. So Sandy had his notebook open and we were, I was writing in his notebook what I was seeing because my eyes are better. Sorry, Sandy. And uh, <laughs> huh, old age will do that to you. Just ask yeah. the other three guys or two guys. Over. <laughs> we were feverishly taking notes and documenting what we saw and everyone else was just standing there like little, uh, you know, lemmings ready to, to walk along to the next presentation. Mm. So the next thing they presented to us was their current generation drive units. So the guy standing there with the microphone and here you'll see our Model 3 and Model Y gearboxes. And Sandy and I aren't even paying attention. We're just looking at what we just saw. So you had to have a really trained eye to kind of pick up some of the new stuff. And like Sandy said, when we were in the stand in the casting section, I was counting the number of people there offloading each casting. So we were doing in-depth benchmarking of the number of people. What were the people doing? This person's doing a quality check. This person's doing, because we want to understand um, the savings that they're getting from this giga casting process. It was the first time we saw them in production. So we're yeah. doing, doing math, counting people. Well, everybody else is kind of, you know, wide, wide eyes looking around. So it was, it was pretty, pretty high. Yeah. Yeah, so so Sam, why, let me ask, I... let me ask you this. Okay. okay. We've all been in lots of factories. Okay. Um, and, and you said that as you're walking around the Austin plant, you know, that you, you're, you're seeing things that are entirely different. Okay. So, so give us a flavor of, of what would be standard operating procedure in any of the plants that we could, you know, that, that are within the vicinity of where we're all at in our respective places and what you saw down there? Well, let's start off with something that you might find interesting. A lot of guys might find interesting. Um, um, what I found out was how quickly they could uh, cast the front and rear castings. I already knew that walking in. Um, what was the cycle time? 
That's what I was going to get to. 43 okay. seconds per second. Wow. That's wow. what, oh, sorry, sorry. That's, no, that's incorrect. The assembly line is at 42 seconds. The assembly line is 42 seconds. People hit 60 seconds and they, you know, break out the champagne. Right. These guys are at 42 seconds. So I did that with three consecutive cars heading down the line. And that's, then I found out that the, um, the cycle time. So we all know that the, uh, the castings are made in less than a second, right? So they, they uh, close the press, turn it on a second later, the, the castings inside, it takes 32 to 34 seconds for it to cool it down to the point where you can open it and get it the heck out. And, um, and so I was, you know, I've seen lots of videos and whatnot on this, but I've never seen the casting itself. Uh, this was my first time looking at it and it's got all kinds of wonderful things. So there's a thing called peanuts. You use them for uh, capturing to make sure that everything's flowed properly the peanuts fill up and then you know that this casting is probably going to be in good shape. And then it goes up to the top and there's a um, thing that looks like a little waffle or something. And in essence, what it is, is a, it's a, a radiator kind of. So the, the metal goes up there. It hardens because it's going in and hardening, right? Because it, it's the, that part of the, of the die is cool. And then it goes down and it acts like its own shutoff. So that, that totally blew me away that they were showing us. I mean, it was wide open for everybody. So then I started looking at um, die casting in general, and I found out, well, I kind of already knew that most people are right around, I don't know, maybe uh, six or eight percent scrap, but the scrap can be ground up and you can do it again um, in, in most cases. Um, then I started doing some in depth kinds of stuff. And I found out that in Europe where, you know, BMW does die casting and whatnot, they think that world class is about 4%. And then through nameless sources, I found out that Tesla is running 2% scrap. Now they may be not, they, they may be the scrap that they actually throw away, but the 2% is what they'll live with. 2% scrap. So think of stamping factories. How much do you throw away there? Oh, we recycle that. We, we sell that scrap iron to somebody else or this or that. It's scrap. It's awful and you can't do much with most of it. And if you want to do something with it, you got to you got to scrub that Pillsbury off the stamping. So for me, the biggest thing that I wanted to see was the uh, was the die casting and whatnot, and um, and when you guys are ultimately going to want to talk about the twenty five thousand dollar vehicle, when you're <laughs> when you're looking at the 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 skateboard, basically having around two percent scrap rate, uh, that's uh, that's going to be pretty hard to to beat, um, and a forty three second cycle time. So 42, yeah. 43. Yeah. How about you, Corey, T to, to Gary's question? What, what did you think was different that you saw that you would not see in a traditional plant? Well, first of all, the scale of the plant is humongous. So I've been in a decent amount of factories, not as many as Sandy, but I think I've been in about a dozen. It, it, the, the building is like a mile and a half long or it's a mile. How long is it? It's huge. Long. And it's, when you're in the main floor, it's actually two levels. So they have a main floor and a mezzanine level where they have offices. And then the, what looks like the roof is the floor of an entire another whole section. And it's like a cement floor on the second level. Hmm. So we weren't seeing any of the Cybertruck line. So somewhere in that building, they're probably preparing the Cybertruck line. On that third floor, floor, you think? I, I think it'd be the uh, second main floor or the third okay. floor. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's massive portions of that building that that we didn't even see. Yeah. And and John, I got to say, I love the video that you did on your assessment of how Tesla is going to assemble cars in the future. I, I watched that. It was really, really good. And that, I think, is absolutely critical for them getting the cost down. So mm. 
typically the manufacturing cost is not a huge cost driver in the vehicle, but it is when you're trying to scale and you don't want to build 20 plants, you want to build 12 plants or 10 plants. Right. So to hit that 20 million number that, that Elon has put out there, he's got to get there without having to build 20 assembly plants or 30 assembly plants. If you look at the throughput of traditional OEMs. So I think it, it shrinks the size of the plant by 40%. I think that's what they said. That's what they said. And I see a huge advantage in the body shop, in the, in, sorry, in the paint shop. So now mm -hmm. that you're not sending an entire vehicle through the paint shop, the, the volume of a vehicle, so width-wise, height-wise, length-wise, you can now paint in more of a planar fashion. So if you have two body sides, a hood, fenders, rear fascia, front fascia, the width, the amount of area you're going to have to take up and even even the tooling and articulation of your paint robots changes completely if you're only painting essentially from one direction if you separated the vehicle and you send it through so i think there's so many so many rabbit holes you can go down on the efficiencies that they'll gain uh, with this new way that they're not only building the car but how they paint the vehicle right and uh, i like you said that they were probably going to use structural adhesives I do agree. It'll be structural yeah. adhesives and a combination of threaded fasteners. Well, here, right, so, so we should, it, well or self-piercing. For, for people who haven't seen your other. video, John, ex explain what this process is. Okay, we're well, assuming yeah, people know so what a little it bit, is. a little bit of background. You know, uh, most people don't know this, but the the moving assembly line is actually a very inefficient process. And and the the reason, I, you know, just to use simple numbers, which I used in my video, if your cycle time is sixty seconds, which is typical for a legacy plant. Uh, that means every worker has essentially 60 seconds for their station to get their tasks done. And they walk along the car as it goes down the line. Then they have to walk back to the head of their assembly station, pick up parts and start again. Well, they typically have, it, it varies by station, but rule of thumb, 40 seconds to do their task and then 20 seconds to walk back, pick up parts and start it over again. That 20 seconds is is wasted time it's not value added yeah and the way that you make up for that inefficiency is you just have more stations and more people on the line which just adds cost so by by getting rid of the the moving assembly line and essentially uh designing the car to be assembled as modules that all come together at once at the very end lets you have uh it, it opens up the modules to being assembled with automation it allows workers to get around things, not having to lean over, climb in and out of the car and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that the savings overall are going to be even greater than what I talked about in my video. Mm. Mm. So is, is that an efficient way to, to build cars, Sandy? I mean, modules and, and what what are the natural pieces that would go, you know, that would that would. Be well, modularized. actually, the, the natural pieces are the ones that uh, that they showed in the video. So if you go to their if you go to their website or actually we've ripped it. And Here we go. Here, Here we've got the, some yeah. of the modules there. There you go. So what you're looking at here is uh, basically the whole body. And you'll see it's already all painted. I don't have to take the doors off, put them back on. I don't have to take the hoods. And in a, in a lot of cases, deck lids don't don't get touched. They just get painted once. But it causes an awful lot of um, consternation. When you're trying to get this thing down the line in the paint department, robots have to dive in there and do what they have to do in order to get the paint onto the, uh, onto the material. When you're looking at something like what is shown here, um, I mean, a long skinny paint line is a whole lot better than a great big gigantic wide one with, uh, that has to run relatively slow. And like and, what and Corey Sandy, just said. If I can interject too, when you have a full body in white, you have to leave room for the robots with those big exactly. pincher welders and all that. So you compromise right. the design of the body to allow robots to get in there. With this mm -hmm. new process, you don't have to do that. That's correct. So you you leave um, you leave a leading edge um, all around everything so that somehow you can get in there. And quite frankly, um, those uh, those pincers are not cheap. It's it's kind of expensive to uh, to put in all the stuff that we normally put in to, to make a vehicle. So at the end of the day, um, this is something that no one's ever, well, that's not true. Uh, other people have thought of taking the doors and sending them down through a different paint line. And that 
uh, that doesn't really work out well because now you've got a separate paint line and on and on and on. But if you have the same paint line and you're running the cars, by the way, there's another thing here too. All the, all the stylists on the planet, every one of them, they want to have one thing that nobody wants to have, two-tone paint. Um, uh, that's why we put big, giant blackout panels and appliques and whatnot so that we don't we can get a, a different contrasting color or something, but we don't have to try and shoot two colors. With this, you want to have red doors? No problem. I mean, uh, you, can, you can do whatever you want. You can make well this... Think about it too. You build up a whole body in white. Then you got to dump dump the whole thing in the the Elpo, Elpo tank. Yeah. Then then you got to bring that out. You got to you know let that all drip dry and stuff. And then you start painting. So you're painting yeah. a lot and you're coating a lot of places that maybe don't even really need it. You're right. So you're adding cost. You're adding weight. You're adding assembly time. This new Tesla process gets rid of all that. But here's another question for you guys: Do you think they're going to paint? Why not go with a wrap? Well, um, you can go with a wrap. My guess is that this is uh, this is a good idea for right now. But anybody that ever wanted to say, hey, there may be an opportunity here to go to um, plastic or carbon fiber or composite or whatever. Okay, now I can shoot them in color. What do I need that for? And actually, that's what we're doing with Aptera. The Aptera car probably is not going to see paint. It's uh, it's carbon fiber. It'll come in in color, and that's that. And it it's the same sort of a deal. The 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 Aptera is uh, is going to be showing up uh, with a perfect body, perfect. And that's kind of like what you can get out of this process that uh, that Tesla is showing you. Um, they may be using steel initially, but eventually they might be going to something else. So so basically, Sandy, are are you saying that like for the the Aptera? That the color is put in the mold when the part is created. Therefore, yeah. there's no secondary operation required. That's correct. Yeah. Well, and even even with this new Tesla process, as you guys know, in a typical assembly plant, the, the paint shop is the most expensive part of the plan. It, right. they're, they're typically $300 million or more. Minimum. They're very yeah. energy yeah. intensive. And, yeah. uh, you know, so mega savings, you know, no, by simplifying all that. It. Just Just yeah. think about the pollution control. Are you kidding? That is the absolute biggest uh, cost uh, associated with pollution in any factory is the paint shop. How do you get rid of all the crap that, uh, I mean, nobody wants to have a paint shop in their city ever. And you, you're always crawling with, uh, with people who want to inspect. To make sure you're not cheating this all goes away i mean with what they're talking well let me rephrase that it all goes away with aptera but it's uh it's still going to be something that they're going to be doing with um uh with uh t tesla but but it's not going to be um it's not going to be as arduous because i don't have i don't have uh, spray guns shooting all over the damn place i mean if you watch uh, if you watch a paint line, you'll see that uh, the, the you have to you have to clear the jets on the spray guns before the robots allowed to. I'm sending it into the air. So if I'm underneath the car or whatever, all these things happen. And uh, and quite frankly, um, every one of those extra little bursts that you have to have that causes more pollution. And it, in essence, it just uh, it just throws paint down into the, um, into the, there's a suction that brings it down. All that stuff has to be taken away and, and tossed. When you're looking at smaller pieces that are painted on both sides by simple robot mechanism, I mean, it's, it's going to cost less and it's going to be, it'll, it'll require uh, a whole lot less maintenance. Yeah. I, I see it as being a hundred percent better all the way around. Yeah. So, so John, uh, in Tesla's presentation, they essentially said that they're going to get these cost reductions on their next gen vehicle through three places. I think one was through these improvements in manufacturing. So how the car's built, how it's assembled. Another big chunk was, I believe, powertrain and battery. And that's um, where Monroe has a real strength is our understanding of what those things cost. So Sandy doesn't know this, but I have a whole cost of bill material from a Model Y broken down into 60 line items. 
And I'm not going to give away our costs on this for free. But <laughs> Just going to say, there goes the sales. <laughs> yeah, but 43% of the cost of a Tesla Model Y is the powertrain, battery pack, the cooling pack, the gearboxes. You know, so that's front and rear motor. That's for an all-wheel drive version in the battery. And, so and what percent was that again? Really pull a lot of cost out. They essentially have to slash that 43% of the cost in okay. half. Now, they stated that the cost of their drive unit is going to be about $1,000. Right. The vehicle most likely will be rear-wheel drive. So that'll end up being about a quarter of the cost if you factor in. Um, you're saving about half the cost on one unit, and then it's only going to be in the rear. So huge savings there. And then from a battery perspective, the vehicle must be smaller, and it'll probably end up being 40 to 50 kilowatt hours and lithium iron phosphate. So based right. on just rough napkin math, that's about tw ten to $12,000 off the manufacturing cost of the vehicle. And the fact that they they insource all these components mean they're, they're already not paying a supplier the supplier markup. So think of all the suppliers out there, Continental, Bosch, Magna, they exist. They have huge staffs that sell. They have overhead. They have buildings. Those organizations exist off of the profit margin they're making off of selling all their components. If they eliminate um, that profit margin that they're paying external partners, um, that's even more saving. So, Sandy, what are your thoughts on where where will they have to cut costs? Well, one of the things that they've done to cut costs is they've gone from wound motors to uh, hairpin motors. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. They didn't talk about it, but they showed it. And I about peed my, I couldn't believe it. I'm getting all excited. And the guy next to me, he was a financial guy of some sort, because we eventually got a seat. Uh, they said, oh, maybe you might like to have a, you know, a, um, uh, a coffee or something before the, uh, the team comes back on stage. And, um, and so they all buggered off. And when they came back on stage, I mean, I'm all excited. I just saw what I was hoping to see. And that drops the, uh, the price significantly because it's fully automatable. General Motors uh, invented that, give them kudos for that. But they invented the hairpin motor and, and it is a breeze to automate. It's fabulously easy to automate those. Um, I, I don't have a, a Pavese machine is a wonder to watch, but they're expensive. They're the things that usually people buy from windings. This, this is just absolutely amazing. Now, what do you get out of that? Well, you get a boost, somewhere between 20 and 30% better power out of that thing. And it's cost, it costs less, at least 15 plus percent less because I can fully automate it. It's, it's, a, it's a great idea. So I'm thinking that there's one good example, but then if we look at the... If we look at the batteries, holy mackerel, <laughs> Corey and I, when Corey and I got a chance to go and see the dry cell manufacturing, I mean, again, all these guys are looking around and uh, do you think they'll have cocktails? Um, I was hoping we could get shrimp, you know, Stanley, that kind of stuff. That, that's a little stretch. Some of them were asking good questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So the big question for me was how much difference is there? So let's say that this right here, Right here, that's your standard um, standard uh, line for for making um, a battery pack, and a whole bunch of that is uh, reclaiming or adding and reclaiming of the solvents that they need in order to make that thing. With a dry cell, how about down to one third the size? Two thirds is gone. And when they showed that that vision, um, uh, they they had a little. We weren't allowed to take pictures, but they showed the little vision of that. I have, I couldn't believe it. This is, I mean, oh Sandy, you don't understand prismatic, blah blah blah. Okay, give me a prismatic on that one. I mean, or not prismatic, but uh, pouch pouch. Oh, yeah. So are and, they going to be able to, to solve? I mean, they're, they're having a problem with it with that battery. Are they going to be able to solve it and scale it? Well, so uh, while, while we were there, um, they did mention, somebody asked a question, are you using a dry process on the anode and the cathode? And their answer was both. So 
they I believe they're the one that's on the copper. I forget. I think it's the anode. Uh, that they've gotten the dry process down, but the cathode from based on what they said, they said both on that. So I feel like they've struggled to scale yeah. the second half of it, yeah. but clearly there was a ton of uh, production happening while we were there. They were creating these rolls called mother rolls that were 1.5 kilometers long and they were 16, uh, 16 batteries in width that they cut eight, eight times to create 16 rolls or I uh, no. They cut 15 times to create 16 rolls. Right. And then the slit ones ended up being what goes into the battery pack. So each cell, sorry, not the pack. Um, so they were producing, but also on the line, we noticed that there was 2170 packs being installed into Model Ys in Texas. So not all of the packs being installed were the structural packs that we, that, you know, we have at Monroe that we've torn down. Yeah. So, so the forty six eighties. Yeah. So the we did not see forty six eighty packs being installed in final assembly. Do you remember seeing that, Sandy? I pointed that no. out. No. Uh, yeah, I saw the twenty one seventies. So uh, at the end of the day, they said that they were running twenty one seventies, or they had twenty one seventies going into the packs. The forty six eighties, they had two styles: the old style and the new dry cell style. And what they talked about was the new dry cell style. And for that, they said that they were they were looking at a, um, a giant amount of material savings because they didn't have to reclaim solvents and on and on. Um, at the end of the day, when you look at everything in aggregate, the $25,000 vehicle seems to be well within their reach. Um, I have no idea what everybody else is going to do, but I do know that, that they're yeah. going to be in they're going to be in really good shape here real yeah. soon. And the, the biggest news to me, to me personally, was the switch to 48 volts for the rest of the yeah, EV, that, yeah, the right. electrical architecture. Hey, hey let, let's get into that. But uh, we got to take a quick commercial break. We got to give a good thanks out to our sponsor here, Bridgestone. But let, let's come back to that, Corey. We'll pick it up right after this. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on what roads? It's their hydro track technology. But you don't have to know how the science works just where the brake is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. All right, we're back. And yeah, let's talk 48 volt because the voltage in cars hasn't changed since like the mid 1950s. Yeah, and oh, I, I, I mentioned It's always this. been 12 volts. Yeah. It's, it's always been, always, right? You no, no, no. You had two six volts combined or you had, uh, or you had a 12 volt. So. No, it's a look it up, Sandy. It was six volts up through the early 1950s. No, oh, okay. All right. Uh, I'll take your word for it. I, fact, I, 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 think, it was... I think Ford was the first one to go across the line 12 volts in, in sometime in the early 50s. Huh. Well, there you go. I have one anyway, thing. But yeah, go I ahead. It might be older than me anyway. So. Yeah, the, the wattage demand. Gary <laughs> and I are much, much younger. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the wattage demands of modern vehicles is so much higher. Um, it's incredible. Yeah. Vehicles are larger. So I was driving to work today. I drive a Yukon XL. It's huge. And I see this tiny car. I thought it was a Geo Metro. I'm like, oh, what is that? And it was a Dodge Caravan from like the late 80s, early 90s. And it was so small. I'm like, what is this? A little clown car. So our vehicles are larger. The electrical demands are so much higher. If you look at electric power steering, electric e-boost, um, you have electric park brake. These are high uh, energy, high wattage demand systems. It only makes sense to switch to 48 volts. The savings that you can get on the wiring is astronomical. And I was having dinner with uh, a couple engineers on Tuesday and I mentioned this and all of them were like, oh yeah, you know, everyone's known that 48 volts is the right voltage, but, Man. and these worked at, these people worked at traditional OEMs. And they're like, yeah, but you know, no one could ever commit. And I said, well, Tesla's doing it. And they're like, well, it's the right decision. So even traditional OEM engineers know that this is the right decision, but the shock that it's going to send to the supply base, because let's say you're a seat supplier and you make seats, your motors and all your adjustments are all 12 volts. Well, Tesla makes their own seats. So they've eliminated that. Now you have an HVAC supplier. All the blower motors are 12 volts. Well, a lot of them have switched to 
um, brushless PWM. So the switching there isn't as big of a deal. Same thing with your fan motor for your for your cooling pack. Those are brushless. So they already have converters in there. So some of the, the higher draw systems are they're primed for switching. It's the little stuff that doesn't matter. Your door lock mechanisms, your trunk latch, that's where it's going to be more expensive. It's not the, the high draw thing. So Tesla's really committing if they're going to switch all their lighting. And now that lighting is already LED, you already have conversion there. So cars are ready. They're ready for 48 volts. They're finally just pulling the bandaid off. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing. <laughs> they made they made a, the announcement, of course, that, um, you know, whatever they can't buy, they're going to make themselves. <laughs> Holy doodle. Okay, so when you're, when you're looking at the tier ones, they're probably rubbing their hands together and going, oh, my God, what's going on here? But think about it, uh, like like those kinds of components are like two, they're, they're tier two, tier three kind of uh, components. If Tesla starts making their own 48 volt sensors and whatnot, what are these guys gonna do? Um, and, and guess what they won't have? There will never be a shortage, never. I w and I'm sure that the two of you can remember when I used to sit on your show and say, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, that, uh, that this, uh, Outsourcing is a good idea. I thought for a long time we went way too far away from vertical integration. And usually people would say, well, you're going to have your own, uh, you know, rubber plantations and whatnot. I said, well, maybe not that far. But at the end of the day, I'm telling you, I was right then. And by the way, I, I got to tell you that when I was at Ford, and this is in the 80s, in the 80s, everybody wanted to go to 48 volt systems everybody except for one group finance <clears throat> so there you go so finally engineering is going to win out over finance are you kidding me we can buy those things. yeah not anymore so tesla has changed that um, a little bit and it's it will phone it's going to force everybody else to do it right why should i have twice as much weight for my uh for my uh, componentry uh, like for the wiring and whatnot, any, anything that's low voltage, it's yeah, going to be. The, the OEMs who don't switch will just be at a disadvantage. And it's a disadvantage that the customer won't realize. So it'll just end up in the either the pricing of the vehicle or lost profit margin for the business. For yeah. The yeah, and think about it. It's going to take them forever to change anyway. Even if they make the decision right now this afternoon, it's going to take them years to make yeah. that change. And imagine, yeah. imagine if you're at GM and you're just now rolling out your Ultium platform and then they have the Ultify platform, which is supposed to underpin their architecture for probably a decade or two. And just a few weeks ago, Tesla announced 48 volts. That means you're going to be the whole time that Ultify Ultium platform will be in use for the next 10, 20 years. You're going to be obsolete. You're, you're obsoleted already at a disadvantage. So, so, so let, I mean, let's, let's put some, some boundaries around this so we can understand what this disadvantage really means. I mean, so a number, you know, Mercedes has had 48 volt systems. BMW has been using 48 volt systems, but ah. they have a 12 volt system oh. as well. Right. Right. So, big, so for, big difference. Okay. Big but, difference. Right. Okay. But so how big is the big difference? What, what impact does that difference have yeah. either on the manufacturer or on the person who owns the vehicle? Yeah. So first of all, those 48 volt systems you've mentioned, we're really aware of those. Those are typically for PHEVs or mild hybrids. They would add a 48 volt battery for a belt start generator. And this was mm. real prevalent about 10, 12 years ago. When they added those 48 volt systems, sometimes even higher, sometimes they were 90 volts. Nice. They would then be like, okay, now that we have this other battery in here for the hybrid, let's run the steering rack and the e but they'd run four or five items off of it to get the savings on those wiring but to go whole vehicle that's the big deal everything else that's where you get your savings because there's so much wiring in a vehicle for the low voltage wiring that's where you're gonna yeah. attacking one or two systems there's small savings but then also having a 12 volt lead acid battery it's like it's like having both the worst of both worlds sandy mm. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, everything that Corey just said is absolutely 100% true. We've looked and heard about everything that so that everybody's thinking about doing one of these days, but they didn't. And so, and we, we talked about the wiring, but actually the connectors are smaller too. Everything about it, it gives you, so I, I've been telling everybody, you know, oh, we gotta have range, we gotta have bigger batteries. No, that's not true. What you really need is number one, arrow. Number two, friction. Number three, um, um, weight. And number four, which is the absolutely most important, efficiency. And that efficiency can only come by getting rid of these boat anchor things that you don't really need. And one of those boat anchor things that you don't really need is a 12 volt system. If you can move to 48 volts, I can reduce the gauge of the wire. Why is Tesla so much? I mean, when you look at the Audi e-tron, it's got, what is that, 110 kilowatt hours or something in their, in their battery? I can't remember, something like 100. that. 100. What? I think, 100, I think it's 90 or 100 kilowatt hours. I thought it was more than that. But anyways, what's Tesla got? 73, that one I do know. And yet it goes further, goes faster, and goes longer. What? I don't get it. How can that possibly happen? Because it's the inefficiencies that are associated with the delivering of the power and actually the accepting of the power. Every time, every time somebody does something inside the car with a switch, a button, uh, there's a little bit, there's a little bit, you, you lose, you lose every time. And that's why when we, uh, we, we, we help people redesign the cars, oh man, it's like, I can't, I can't begin to tell you, sometimes it's just like fish, shooting fish in a bucket, not a barrel, a bucket, because it, well, have you thought of this? Well, I don't think, stop, stop right there. You are correct. You didn't think. And they don't like it when you say that kind of stuff. But, but at the end of the day, the job is to try and keep as many companies as we possibly. It's not just, we don't have Tesla as a customer. They don't need us. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, every, every car company that, that I look at that has a problem, that's something we should try and help out with as much as we possibly can. I, I don't wanna see a whole bunch of companies uh, go belly up. I'm not here voting for one car company. I, I'd like to see us doing things that are in a smarter fashion. And that means changing the way we think, changing the way we do things, changing the, the engineering preconceived notions. Oh, no, no, we have to have 12 volt, why? Why? What does it do for me? Well, we've always done it. Execute that man. That's the that's what I, I think really needs to happen. I think brooming some of these characters out of the way or changing the rules and regulations as to how you um, how you decide what innovation really and truly needs to happen. That those are the things that I mean, we can talk about Tesla all day long. Yeah, they're doing stuff brilliantly. What is everybody else doing? I mean, how are they going to keep up? How? Sandy, you've been saying that for 30 years. I mean, that. Well, it, I, it, I got to memorize now. <laughs> okay. But, so, 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 so what will it take to make other people in industry finally understand this? I mean, is, is it is it basically because, you know, Tesla's in their face now and, and they can't avoid looking at it? And it used to be that they could like blithely go on their way and pretend that business as usual is fine? Well, um, that's going to be one thing, but um, Boss Kettering, we all kind of know who he was. Um, he invented fast drying paint. He invented Freon. Um, he was the guy who gave us the electric starter, all kinds of things. Um, and he said that uh, nature has to take his course. And then he would go on to explain that <laughs> nature meant that these guys are going to die and maybe somebody else will come along and take their place. I mean, it's the only thing that can happen. Something has to die for something else to live. Right. And some of these old ideas have to die. And as a rule, you know, when old Charlie uh, walks away from uh, being the guy in charge of holding back the uh, radical new stuff that, uh, that, that these clowns are talking about, when Charlie moves away, guess what? We'll be able to progress. Yeah. And that's the way it is. <laughs> I don't even think it's going to happen then. You know, one thing that came across to me for, you know, master plan part three is how they do so many things concurrently, design, engineering, yeah. manufacturing, designing of the manufacturing equipment, everybody working real time in one room, reporting to one person. Right. 
And none of the legacies are set up to be able to do that. The only ones who I think maybe have a chance are Ford and Renault. And I only say that because, you know, they, they, they've they split off their EV operation. They can start right. clean sheet. But the other ones will have to go through enormous structural, and I mean corporate structure, mm -hmm. changes. And they're not set up to do that. I hope they're even talking about it. I haven't heard any of them talk about it. Yeah, and, wow. and John, one thing I noticed when I was at the Tesla factory is that the culture of the people is different. <clears throat> when I interface with a lot of my uh, friends and classmates who work at traditional OEMs, typically my conversation with them is like, hey, how's it going? And they talk about their career. They talk yeah. about their career inside of GM or Ford. Oh, well, you know, I'm uh, applied for a level eight and my bonus was this. And it's like, you talk to anyone from Tesla and it's never about themselves. It's always about where the company's going, the advancement of, of, of their goals and their mission. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a, a different mentality and it's kind of actually refreshing to hear people from Tesla versus people from traditional OEMs. And you mm -hmm. can kind of see that in how they operate, particularly in their presentation Sandy and I liked one slide where they talked about how they've internalized the development of their software that they use to run their business. And, yeah. and we're a small business. So Sandy and I will have to have some software for our 401k and our software for our AP and AR. And it's a huge pain. And you try and tailor the software for our small business needs. And Tesla has their own internal software group that develops software for them, how they sell the cars, how they collect the data. That is not how it is at no. most traditional. No, companies. you're so, so I'm looking at my notes that I took from that. Right. And so they called it the, to, the Tesla OS yeah. and the same software is for sales. It's for orders. It's for financial services. It's for accounts payable. Mm -hmm, right. It's for document generation. And they've got a feedback loop too, mm -hmm. so that they can learn how to make it even more efficient. I've never heard of any company, well, automotive or whatever, talk yeah. about an OS for the corporation. Because they buy it. They, they buy SAP. Right. right. Okay? So, so, SAP what, so, so what, what's wrong with buying SAP? I mean, oh, just, just for, you obviously <laughs> have never oh tried to God. use that shit. I mean, oh, my God. You got to be kidding there, me. You there's the be... apocryphal story. The, the SAP guy comes in and he's there so long he joins the bowling league. But that's exactly. That's well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The uh, the aged bowling league, um, I mean, a senior bowling league. Yeah, I, I, SAP is like a nightmare. Um, interfacing it with anything, and we've tried to interface it with our software, and then what they'll do is they'll make a change and it doesn't work anymore. So they they tried to you know lock everything in, but I I can guarantee you for sure that uh, whatever Tesla came up with is going to be a whole lot simpler. By the way. There are other car companies that you should know about that do have um, vertical integration. And on top of that, they look at, um, they look at a team in a slightly different way and they all live in China. That is a problem for all North American car companies because eventually, regardless about uh, how much uh, the president wants to stomp his foot, regardless of whether he happens to be a Republican or a Democrat, it makes no difference. Sooner or later, sooner or later, they will get in to the United States. And that's why I'm trying to help out as many car companies as we possibly can, especially here in the U.S., because quite frankly, I do not believe we have the talent, the techniques, or even the will to try and take them on. I, 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 I think I showed you guys uh, a chart a long time ago and I said, somebody said, well, who do you think the biggest is gonna be in 2030? And I said, probably BYD. I haven't changed that view. I think that in North America, Tesla may, may, may take a fairly large chunk. It'll be a little less now, thank goodness, that Toyota fired Toyota and put in, um, I think Sako is his name, Sako san Sato, and, yeah. Yeah, and um, I met him a long, long time ago. He probably doesn't remember me, but I remember him. 
he uh, he's a smart guy and he understands business and he's also an engineer. So I think that he's going to make a big, big difference. And I believe he's going to spin the Toyota boat around. And then like where I saw things falling off, like, uh, I don't want to get into it, but VW and, and Toyota both. And then GM simply because uh, I just don't, anyhow, let's just go on. So, okay. So, so like, those three companies, so Toyota, Volkswagen, General Motors, so right. are you suggesting that you think that Toyota has a better chance than the other two? I mean, and, oh, I you know, know it now. Oh, absolutely. You know, are you, you kidding? Know, yesterday, uh, yes, yesterday, the 193 billion bucks that, that VW said it's going to be spending on EVs. You think that that is. Where are they going to get it? What are they stage? going to sell next? I'm going to, they're going to have to sell Audi for sure. I mean, they got rid of Porsche. They're going to have to go and sell something else. What are they going to sell? And what are they going to sell? Uh, or let me rephrase that. You know, they, what was it, last October or whatever, whenever they announced their new diesel engine. You know what? Sometimes you got to cut and run. Um, and uh, they didn't. So they're hoping for the underprivileged uh, countries on this planet uh, will still maintain uh, the diesel and the gasoline and uh, whatever, but they don't buy nearly as many cars as what, Volkswagen is trying to sell. Volkswagen, I made a mistake. I predicted they were going to clobber everybody. I figured that the mistake with the, the diesel gate and whatnot, that company had spin around and with Dietz at the helm, right to the moon. But um, I, uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, so and I, so I, a question for Sandy and, and Corey. You guys think Toyota's really going to do a, a restructuring of the company? Oh, yeah. I do. No question <laughs> about it. If yeah, they're I, if they're committed to a new path, they'll execute very quickly. And mm -hmm. we've always been impressed with Toyota vehicles for decades. Yeah. Um, and they do they don't have they're not as far behind as you would think because they have so much expertise in the hybrid realm, particularly with the Prius and all the Prius variants. So when it comes to thermal systems, batteries, traction motors, that's all very scalable. So they're not starting from, from scratch. They just need to learn to scale up a full vehicle, full BEV, a full right. purpose built BEV instead of uh, right. what they currently have. Yeah. They'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, if you think back, uh, the first Toyota I ever saw had a chain drive. I could not believe my eyes. Guy crawls underneath the car. Look at, I bought a new car. And, we, and he says, it doesn't even have a prop shaft. And I looked up and I saw that and I said, <laughs> good luck, Chumley. Well, it didn't take long before everybody was buying a Toyota. My dad, oh, I'll never buy a Japanese car. Well, World War II kind of guys, they, they said things like that. But it wasn't long. It didn't take long before even the guy across the street who has died in the wool, I'm only buying a GM product, showed up with his Toyota saying, I love this car. It works really well and blah, blah. Toyota has a way of turning every adversity around. And like I said, um, I think that they're going to come along. I think Toyota, Honda, uh, well, most of the most of the uh, most of the Asian car companies are are definitely in it to win it, whereas and other guys are still arguing, still Sandy, arguing. Sandy, what car did you buy yesterday? I didn't buy it. You did, <laughs> yeah. but it was uh yeah we bought a Kia and um, no no or sorry uh, Hyundai a Hyundai Ionic five Ionic yes, and so Sue drove it last night and um, uh, we I couldn't film her because there were so many expletives. Here's the deal. When you put a car into the marketplace, into today's marketplace, and you're going to try and take over some part of the EV market share, and you don't have what everybody's used to. Okay, so you go in a Rivian, it's going to work just like the Tesla, and on and on and on. But if you don't have that, if you want to do push button start, push button stop, Step on the brake. Don't do this. Oh, this one doesn't have it. Doesn't have regen, and you're just you're kissing the market goodbye. You have to be basically copying. This isn't a time to say, "Oh, we're going to set the standard." Don't 
do it. Don't set the standard because you're going to lose. The Ionic um, is going to be a good car. I'm sure we're going to find lots of good things in it. Um, and I'm sure that um, I'm sure that when I get a chance to drive it, because I've driven more electric cars than what Sue has, I'm sure I'll have a, a better view of it. But last night I was pooped. I got off the plane. She was driving. I'm not really interested in driving right now. I'll try it out maybe tonight or something. But I'm sure I, I will have a different opinion. But Sue, look at the buttons. Look at this. Look at this. How do I find that? I'm, and it's got buttons and it's just totally um, overwhelming. That car, that car needs to have a scrubbing. And when it gets scrubbed down to what, you know, is going to be commonplace in the marketplace, it's going to save them a tremendous amount of money. Because remember, every button costs something. Every button has the potential for failure. Every button is 12 volts. Every button is mechanical. On and on and on. And that kills your efficiency. So every time you push a button, you're kissing away some of it. In fact, um, I, was, uh, I gave a bunch of speeches when I was uh, at this uh, High Point University. And I started talking about edge computing. And, um, and uh, one of the guys put up his hand, he says, What's edge computing? So I explained, you know, you try and get everything as close as you can because you don't want to lose any time whatsoever. And the guy says, wow, this stuff all runs at the speed of electricity. That's faster than the speed of light. And everybody, oh, well, guess what? Um, everything adds up. Sooner or later, it adds up. So the more you can get to edge computing, the more opportunity you've got for efficiency. And like I said, weight, arrow, friction, efficiency efficiency that's what you want to shoot for it's easy not only is it cheap it actually reduces the cost of the product it makes things go faster everything there it's going to be hard to every every stylist wants a different look so arrow is kind of tough weight if i want to get rid of weight increase efficiency and if I want to get rid of fiction, well, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. But one of them is to make the product more efficient, more effective. And we all know how to do it. It's just that in a lot of cases, sometimes you have to pay a nickel over here, but you can save a dime over there. And that's why this vertical integration stuff works really super well, because one guy is scrubbing the other guy's back. Yeah. Hey, look, we're getting to the top of the hour. And, you know, it, it's interesting. We, we've, we've talked a lot. A lot of great information from both you guys. We, we could do three or more shows on, on that whole master plan part. Yeah. Where there was so much there. Yeah, I, you could talk for a week. You so, so, you know, one of the things John and I talked about off offline um, was one of the things that impressed us was the number of people that they had on that stage that were articulating what yeah. it is that they do. Yeah. And, you know, it occurred to us that we've never seen, at least not in recent history, the traditional automakers bring out that many yeah. people who are going to say, okay, this is what we're doing, whether, you know, it's the, the powertrain engineer or the design guy or the finance guy, or, you know, the human resources person. I mean, it's just like, what, right. was, was that an impressive it, it role was. of people? But in my take on it was Elon was showing the investors and the world that Tesla is more than just him. So with all the Twitter stuff that's been happening, uh, the stock was dropping when when Elon bought Twitter. And to me, it was it was highlighting all the very impressive people and the roles that they play and then lining them all up was like a show of force. Like this is Tesla, not just Elon. It was less about Elon. And a lot of the other investor days and events, Elon talks for 60 or 80% of the time. And oftentimes they'll have somebody else up there. Yeah. But Elon had more of a muted role. And frankly, he was less eloquent and prepared than a lot of his uh, other other people that were really great. Yeah. So, But that's typical Elon. He's, he never is very good on stage when it comes to presenting. So my impression was he was showing the world that Tesla's moving forward, whether or not he's in control or not. He clearly is still the leader, but that that's what I think he was trying to show. Like, hey, look, look at all these people. 
Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> there was almost as many people on stage as there was left in the audience mm -hmm. because they, they took a break and everybody went off to eat shrimp. So at the end of the day, um, Elon and his people were up there and we did not stick around. After about the four stupid ass questions that we did sit around and listen to, we figured, you know what, let's get in a car and get the hell out of here. There's nothing going to happen. We're never going to be recognized because we're way in the heck in the back. And if we did ask a question, I mean, we'd probably chase other people out of the room because um, all they were looking for, they were looking for the golden nuggets, nuggets that, that, that appeal to them. And, uh, what what is your financial forecast for next quarter? <laughs> it, it, how do you how do you explain somebody? Hey, you know what? There's this long vision. Uh, today is here. Tomorrow is somewhere else. Uh, you got to get from here to there, and it isn't next quarter. Oh, I'm bored. You're bored because you don't know what you're looking at. And that's where the pearls to swine thing. It keeps coming up to me over and over again. You know, I, I just can't believe it. They came out and said all these marvelous things that just made me so excited. I couldn't believe it. And then, so I know you don't want to talk about financials, but stop right there. He said he ain't going to talk about it. Why are you asking? I mean, it just, it was very, very, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine um, how these guys could be so ill-informed or why they, why they brought those people in. Why didn't they bring somebody that actually kind of like knew what was going on in the plant, understood what the heck they had uh, just, because they talked for hours. I have no idea how many slides there were, but I'm telling you what, it, there was so much stuff in there. It was like drinking from the fire hose of knowledge. It was just stunning. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, like I said at the top of the show, I was blown away by that presentation. I have never seen such a thorough presentation, so comprehensive yeah. in so many different places of a company uh, as that one was. And the stock dropped like 8%, right? As, mm -hmm. as soon as the thing was over and after hours trading. And I, I, I was stunned by that because- Not me. Yeah. You have to, <laughs> what you need to do is get in, get surrounded by, by two, or sorry, 198 other people that have no idea what they're looking at. And then it, suddenly it all becomes clear. Oh, you didn't tell us anything. Oh my God, they, they must be going broke. I can't imagine what a been like, I don't know what the fanciest hotel in, um, oh yeah, we do the Four Seasons. But that, that that was it the Four Seasons? What was the fancy hotel that we had breakfast at? Was that was that not, yeah, Four Seasons. Yeah, four Seasons. So that's where all the um, high rollers went and had their martinis and whatnot. And I'm sure that in those conversations, they convinced themselves that, you know, uh, that, that Tesla is definitely heading south now. Oh, everybody will overtake them. And they're wrong. Yeah. They're 100 percent wrong. And, so, and you know what? I don't know. I don't I uh, <clears throat> I haven't got uh, I got uh, one guy that said, hey, Sandy, um, can you give me an interview? I'm sure your phone is ringing off the hook. Right. Well, it ain't. I didn't have any reporters asking me what I thought because they already know. They didn't. Oh, no quarterly reports. Oh, they're going out of business. Quick. Where's my short sell? Uh, whatever they have. I mean, they just they don't get it. They had no idea what they were looking at. But I'll tell you one thing. I can tell you for sure. Every OEM CEO, every one of them, they looked at that or their people looked at it and they got reports and they went, ah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a good transition, Sandy. I actually have a question for John. So John, I think early on, probably half a decade ago, maybe a decade ago, I think you were kind of lukewarm on the transition to EVs, but I think you see Tesla's progress. I have a question for you, very specific. At one point in time in the future, will Tesla sell more vehicles than GM? Oh, great question. So you're, you're right. I mean, I was very skeptical of electric vehicles because I knew every problem there is with them. And I was very skeptical of Tesla because it kept losing money every single year. It just lost money year after year after year. But as this industry is wont to do, 
it, it runs into a problem and they just keep chipping away at it, chipping away at it, chipping away at it. So, you know, batteries were so expensive. Cost has come down. Batteries were so heavy. They still are heavy. The weight's coming down. Uh, there was no recycling. There Now there's recycling. So what I'm getting at is everything I knew that was wrong, the industry, and in, in not always led by Tesla, but often, they'd just been chopping away at those problems. And uh, and then Tesla 2019, I think it is, they finally made a, a net profit, a gap profit for the year. And that's when I went, okay, boom, these guys, I not, now I believe that they can do it. Um, but when will it sell more than GM? So I want to say uh, GM sells like, I think last year, just under 5 million vehicles. Yeah, that counts some of their Chinese ventures. It does. Sell- it yeah. does. It, it, it counts 445,000 of those little Wuling mini EVs yeah. that, that makes so- $22 in profit. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. I, I, honest to God, 22 they do. Bucks so, is 22 bucks. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I mean, Tesla will need to have. Uh, so, let's just look in the US. I want to see GM does. I I, I got the numbers, but 3 million. 2.1 or something. I thought. No, no, no. I think it's more than that. I think Ford's at, uh, at about 2.4. I think GM's at about 3 million. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, Tesla needs to get to 3 million units of capacity. As soon as it does that, it will outsell General Motors. Well, there's another thing that we have to take into account as well. So right now, the United States has been pounding the table and saying, don't buy Chinese stuff. What happens when China says, oh, take your Yankee dog, uh, GM and uh, Ford and anybody else that's over there and get out of China? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, look, uh, you know, it was interesting because that was a question to, is it Tom Shu? Um at, at Tesla, the uh, the guy who's looking like he's uh, emerging as the COO of the company. But one of the analysts asked, you know, what about China? What's going on? And Elon threw it right in his lap, Tom Shu's lap. And he said, you know, look, we do the best we can. We employ a lot of people. You know, we, ha- we have a lot of suppliers in China, too, that employ a lot of people. And so I, I think the, the more likely thing, rather than China turn on Ford or General Motors, They'll just say, oh, America, you will not sell us uh, uh, high tech chips. Uh, We're not going to sell you any more lithium or cobalt or any of that kind of stuff. You know, just chop off the supply of raw materials and and bring the the U.S. uh, EV industry to its knees. Mm. Well, not everybody, because um, uh, we, you know, (laughs) there's a lot of people in the industry that I know and um, and. there's a lot of places now that uh, that are are showing up saying, "Oh, you want lithium? Oh, we can give it to you." Oh, and by the way, there's a whole city in Ontario called Cobalt for a reason. Um, we have gigantic deserts full of uh, full of lithium or anything else that you want for that matter. I think it's going to be um, an argument between. Uh, alleged environmentalists and um, and um, and progress, and I think that progress will win and the environmentalists will lose. So I think that raw materials may be uh, the sort of the Malachis right now, but at the end of the day, I believe that the big stick is going to be you can't sell cars in China. That will be the big stick, and that will be disastrous to Volkswagen especially Volkswagen and, and General Motors. So, so Corey, when do you think that Tesla will outsell General Motors? Mm. Uh, I think 2029. Oh. So, so here's a question. I said 2028. Uh, and he, what, there's what? Corey saying 2029. So, so, so Corey, Sandy, uh, what's the, the output at Fremont? How many how how many can they make there? And what's the output uh, going to be at Austin? And what's the the output going to be in Mexico? So, Austin. so Sandy, you've already yeah. Sandy already predicted seven hundred and fifty thousand out of out of Fremont? Austin Cybertruck and yeah. Model Y because that's yeah. what they're going to build there. Okay, seven fifty right. there. And then the one in Mexico, the plant's going to be twice as big, but require sixty mm-hmm. percent the floor space. So if you're twice as big, that's 1.5 million. And if you're 60% the floor space, then that's 2.25 million of the little cars. Right. 
So and then Fremont's what? Seven hundred and something. Yeah, it's low. Yeah, well, I don't know if they've ever hit seven hundred thousand, but so, so but last I, year Tesla made one point four million vehicles. Right, <clears throat> around yeah, the world. The, the, and so, most of that's yeah, China. That's, what, what I'm focusing on is I, I think there's a, a chance that uh, Tesla will uh, outsell General Motors in North America before the decade's over. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm talking total right. volume, not just EVs. Right. Well, we're we're looking at uh, we're look, total volume. Yes, you're right. Um, and I, uh, like I said, 2028 is the number that I'm, I'm, I've been hanging my hat on. I moved it from 2030. Corey's at 2029 because he knows I'm old and I can't add. No, <laughs> this is, this is when they'll pass General Motors. Yes, yeah, exactly. 50%. You said Well, the 50%, yeah, 50% is what I think is going to be the market share, but I don't think General Motors are going to be able to keep up because there's going to be other people that are coming in. And they're going to eat away at GM's. Um, it doesn't matter. One year, ain't going to make it. It doesn't matter. It's going to be somewhere around 2028, 2029, 2030. Who cares which exact date uh, it is? I'm just telling you that that the uh, uh, the folks at GM have got to move. Like we were talking uh, just a few minutes ago, we had a management meeting. And GM is doing a lot to try and figure out how they can get rid of the excess that they've got in um, overhead. Uh, I'm not going to just point at engineering or something, but overhead. And um, in their uh, um, to their benefit, uh, or in 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 listening uh, to what Corey had to say, sounds like they've got a good idea. They say, "Oh, we're not going to lay anybody off," <laughs> and then they lay a whole bunch of people up. And then they do evaluations and there's more then people they, gone. Then they offer a buyout. So if you're a low performer, yeah. now you're staring at a buyout offer. I think you'll, yeah. you'll have a decent amount of people taking it. So Gary, yeah. what's your thought on GM offering buyouts to 99% of salaried workers? Well, I, I think that they may be shooting themselves in the foot from the standpoint of there are undoubtedly some good people that they're going to be losing because the people are going to say, you know what? They obviously don't value me that much. Therefore I'll take the buyout and I'll go find somebody that does value me. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Sandy, as you're well aware of, you know, things like profound knowledge, well, that, that takes time to develop. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, propulsion systems, notwithstanding, there are still elements of a vehicle that need to be right in order for someone to want to buy it and to provide value and efficiency right. and so on. I think that they may be just, and, and maybe this is just an HR move that basically they say, well, you know what, we got to, we got to send this letter to all the people because if we target people, it may be lawsuit city. So, well, here's the thing. Um, when we were talking today, <clears throat> we're probably going to need more people. And I said, it's like cancer. I mean, when you carve out cancer, you got to take some of the flesh that is still good with it. And uh, some of that's going to be hitting the marketplace. And that's probably where we're going to be able to pick up a few folks. A, a, a slightly different point of view from my side. My prediction is if there's somebody really good at GM who they really like, we're going to tell them, no, you don't get the buyout. And they'll make it very clear to them. We want you to stay. And to Gary's point, you have to make it blanket. Otherwise, there's sexism, there's ageism, there's, you know, whatever kind of uh, bigotry that the, the company could be accused of. Performance reviews and blah, blah, blah. Believe me, uh, my bet is GM's going to keep the good people and not let them go. Well, there's another option, uh, depending on where you are. Corey was talking about grade eights and whatnot. They don't, they don't get this, but once you hit a certain point in time, and you hit a certain level in the big three, you get the option for VTP, Voluntary Termination Plan. And uh, that's what I took um, when I left. And um, that VTP comes as a result of you either having a total disagreement with the direction of the company or you're, um, you hate your boss or something like that. These things happen and that's how occasionally you'll see somebody saying, Oh yeah, I'm going to be all done by the end of the month. That's VTP. They don't agree and they don't want them hanging around. So here's your piece of paper that says you're not allowed to talk nasty about um, whomever, whatever company you're at. You sign that, you get a big check and you leave. And that's the other option. So yeah, for 
lower level guys, that might be true. But as you move up in the ranks, um, there are a lot of options uh, to get out of a company. Well, when you look at what they're getting rid of, it's uh, middle management, upper levels of middle management. That's right. what they're trying to clear out. Right. Yeah. And it also excluded people who've been hired in the last five years. So if they've done any strategic hiring in the past five years, none of those people were included in this. So, yeah. Okay, but but these people are going to be watching the show and they're going to hear you guys basically saying that Tesla is going to eat their lunch. Therefore, they're looking at their careers going, hmm, maybe we had to go somewhere else. Well, here's the thing. Um, <laughs> they could be thinking that, but most of the time what they're going to be thinking is those guys don't know what they're talking about anyway. And they already tuned out. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. <clears throat> no, it's, it's, it's hard to, I mean, people that have strongly held rules and regulations, um, wind up with something called a scotoma. Uh, it's a block that your eyes are working, but they can't really see. Your ears are listening, but they aren't really. Um, and this scotoma thing is rampant among people who really and truly can't see the future. And there's a tremendous number of them. <laughs> I mean, especially in the, in the auto world, um, there's a lot of guys. In fact, I had an argument with somebody <clears throat> on the airplane, not an argument, but a short discussion. Yeah, you know, those things are going to, you know, disappear. Really? I don't think so. But, ah, no, everybody loves a big V8 and on and on and on. Okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to argue. You know, my dad told me that never argue with a fool. People can't tell who's who. <clears throat> so, um, so you just kind of like move on. And I think that Really and truly, there are people right now that have got that scotoma and they probably turned off already. They don't even want to hear the name to it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It, don't we have a president that doesn't use the name Tesla or Elon he, he Musk? He finally or said it. He finally he finally said it. What? Yeah, when he had to announce the deal with uh charging it's network. Supercharger. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Ah, oh, geez. Okay, I take it all but back. It's, it's Mary Barra <laughs> who I think has never mentioned Tesla, the word. Oh, well, I don't you think are. you can find one instance of her saying, uttering the word Tesla. Well, you'll have to have her on, John. You, you yeah. Have have her Ask her to give her her comments on uh, on what she saw in the uh, or. What? Okay, I'll contact them. I don't have a lot of faith that I'll get her. Other people at GM, really? yes, but you know, Mary is so hard to get. I'm sure they'll just basically say we don't talk about competitors and just leave it at that. Yeah. Ah, uh, that sounds very uh, PC. Yeah. So, so Corey, going back to what you asked before, I just looked it up. Uh, GM sold 2.9 million vehicles in North America last year. Ford sold 2.3 million. So, uh, wow. Yeah. I didn't realize they were that close together. Yeah. 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 And Stellantis sold 1.8 million. But the, the, the funny thing is Stellantis made way more profit than GM yeah. or Ford did. Yeah. They're, they're well, just a, a, reason. They, they, a smaller organization here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the group here in Auburn Hills is just, I think it's like a third the size. A shadow. Yeah. If you go to GM or Ford, they're just massive organizations. Well, yeah. the other thing too is Mark Stewart, who runs Stellantis North America, claims their break-even point is... 30% capacity utilization, which blew my mind. <laughs> you know, the, the industry rule of thumb is you hit 80% capacity and everything above that is, is pure profit. He's claiming their break even is under 30%. Is that possible, well, Sandy? No. I, well, I Let me rephrase that. No, I have <laughs> no idea. I, I have never heard of it. I did, um, I did the studies at Ford Motor Company when I was still in finance staff. And variable break even is what we were looking for. How do we make a plant so it's variable break even point? And uh, there's a lot that goes on inside of a facility that tells me. I mean, you look at your legacy costs. The legacy costs alone um, uh, would kick that thirty percent. I, I don't know. You know what? Uh, what's that old adage? Uh, figures don't lie, but liars can figure, or something. Uh, I I no, don't. No figures don't lie, but liars can. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. something like that. But anyway, at the end of the day, that's a very, very, very low number. Um, and I don't know. Uh, 
I, I don't know what that includes or how they look. I, all you can do is look at the, the profit that they they reported. Well, they, and it is um, but here's the thing. Good. I mean, uh, we don't know anybody, hardly anybody left in engineering. We, uh, we, we definitely don't know anybody. I, would, hardly, I wouldn't say that, Sandy. We, well, we not. Know. Let me rephrase that. OK, a lot of the people that we knew aren't there anymore. A lot of the executives that we knew are not there anymore. Somebody may have taken their place. But uh, no, here's nearly, what's going on. Nearly. The guys in Auburn Hills are down to two platforms, Stella Large and Stella Frame. Everything else has gone to France and Italy. Yeah. So when you do that, when you get rid of that, that much overhead, I mean, it overhead costs when it comes to profit. And if that's gone, if that's walked away, if it's not coming back. Yeah, you can you can run a company, but at 30 percent, no. I, I've never heard I've never heard that kind of a number. I couldn't I, I can't imagine how to get to it. Really. Well, I, 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 look, I, I broke down the numbers. I looked at this all right. So uh, <clears throat> Chrysler North America, you know, Stellantis North America has an operating <laughs> margin almost equal to Tesla. Mm -hmm. 16.4 percent or that's right. It's exactly yeah. right. To 16.8 yeah. for Tesla. Yeah. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. So I don't know if they're going to be able to maintain that, you know, because they now they got to go through the the transition to electric, right? They don't even have one electric on the road, and yeah. uh, you know that that that's going to jumble up what they've. So right now they're sitting pretty. If they can maintain that, you know, God bless them. But it's going to be real tough. So somehow it seems that muscle cars, jeeps, and light duty pickup trucks are not probably going to be internal combustion powered vehicles all are not going to be prosperous for the future for that company. It's hard well, they to can say. ride I it mean, to the end. They can ride it to the end. But, yeah. you know, uh, unless, and, you know, th this is what I was going to ask you guys, too, about Volkswagen and its $25,000 car. I mean, anybody can do $25,000 car. You know, you can buy a Bolt today for $26,000, and yeah. that's even before the $7,500, you know, rebate right. kicks in. But are they making money? You know, anyone can sell a vehicle for twenty five thousand. I I've got a lot of confidence Tesla will make decent margins on a twenty five thousand dollar car. Yeah, I have zero confidence that VW will. I and, can guarantee you that. Uh, go ahead, Corio. Uh, John, I I have a problem with Americans' expectation that a twenty five thousand dollar vehicle is something that we should be. That's what we should be paying. Because think about what's in a vehicle now that wasn't in a vehicle twenty years ago. Think of the FMVSS standards, the amount of ultra high strength steel in the A and B pillar, in your, your crash structure, your airbags. I drove a 1991 Nissan Maxima that sold for $18,000 in 1991. Based on inflation alone, $18,000 in 1991 is like $31,000 in today's dollars. And that Nissan Maxima had no analog brakes, no ultra high strength steel, no airbags. Yep. It had a V6 engine with a manual transmission. I loved it. I loved it. But they were making a ton of money on that. Nissan was selling it at 17 or 18,000 back in 1991. Now, if you look at the, the major cost drivers in an electric vehicle, like I talked about early, 43% of the cost is the battery and powertrain. That amount of money is almost double the the build of material costs of a car built in the early 90s. So the American consumer saying, where is my $25,000 car? It really should be, where's my $34,000 car? If you want to equate it back to expectations in the 90s and 2000s. I'm big on the macroeconomics of affordability. Right. And I 25,000 is, is a super high bar to achieve or, or low threshold for, for people to get under beyond how to get there. I just think the expectations are pretty aggressive for the American. Yeah, but, th but that's always been true, Corey, because, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics always used to uh, show uh, a, a modern car compared to one in 1967. And it is exactly to your point. It's like, holy crap, you know, the, the today's cars are even if it was 10 or 20 years ago or whatever, compared to 1967. The modern car was so much more car for the money. But the reality is, I mean, historically in the United States, it took 
24, 25 weeks of income, annual income for somebody to be able to afford a car. You know, right now, the the average price of a car is about 50 grand and the average household uh, income is about 65 grand. So th that that affordability index of 25 weeks, 24 weeks of income is blown way out of kilter. If, if Tesla or anybody can come out with a good twenty five thousand dollar car and it, it's look, the reality is to sell it. you got to have the amenities that people are expecting. The challenge is make a profit on it. But if somebody comes out with a decent electric that they can make a profit on, it, it's going to be the modern day Model T. It's going it, sales will yeah. explode. And that's that's where I'm coming from as well. I believe that because Tesla is vertically integrated and uh, like I said, uh, I didn't believe in vertical integration all the way to rubber trees. But at the end of the day, he's he's made deals with nickel, uh, nickel mines. Uh, Tesla's made uh, deals with um, or in buying uh, places where you can you can mine lithium or refine lithium. Um, if you can control most of the costs, sooner or later, you are going to be able to uh, to produce something that nobody nobody else can even just dream of. Yeah. So, and and to twenty five thousand, do I think that they'll do that? No, but I know one thing they will do: they will make sure that they make as much profit today as they will on that low cost vehicle. Yeah, and, and the low cost vehicle will still include the hardware for and right. the sensors for uh, their full self-driving capability. Whether or not right. it works to the level that everybody expects, they'll still be selling every vehicle with that, you know, it's $1,500 to $2,500 worth of computing power and sensor suite, camera suite. That's not something other OEMs are going to do. If they sell a low cost EV, like the Bolt, does the Bolt have full self-driving capability? No, probably has a backup camera, you know? Well, here's well, the thing. Well, you know, you, I, you, I you think destroy that, your $25,000 car if you charge $15,000 for FSD. That doesn't work. But you know what? But there, might be, there might be a, another situation here that most financiers never really think about. Most of the people in finance. So I sell them a car and I'm giving away something. Ah, don't do that. But what happens if I sell a car and give something away, but then later on, I can collect more money? Okay, this is like selling razor blades, and that's what they do so well. So now Tesla gets money from when you charge. Tesla gets money if you if you if you decide to get uh, full self driving. Tesla could probably down the road say, well, how about this? How about a monthly fee, not fifteen grand? Uh, but we'll turn that on inside your car for a monthly fee of, I don't know, 200 bucks a month or something like that. People are going to look at it. Oh, that's the same as my cable bill or whatever. I'll do it because it's going to be a lot more comfortable, a lot easier right. for them to get around. And I'm right. telling you what, when you put stuff into a car like what Tesla's putting in where, you know, oh, you don't you, you want to buy uh, you, you don't like your car because the rear seats aren't heated. Done. All we do is push the button, right? That's where that's where Tesla can make money, and um, and everybody else won't. And right. and will it show up in the initial sale? Maybe not. But what will happen later on is, oh, you wanted this, oh, you want that, you want this, you want that, and all of a sudden these magic things come on because they're already there. I mean, we've torn apart enough of the Tesla vehicles to know what we bought. And uh, remember when we tore apart the. Uh, we tore apart the, the Model 3 and we tore it up. And, hey, look at this. Those morons. Look at that. They put um, rear seat heating in. And as soon as Tesla heard that, they turned the rear seat heating on for everybody. Oh, I'm telling you what. These guys are smart. There's a difference between pragmatic and inventive. And they yeah, just, and they're inventive. Sandy, I did the math on the amount of hardware that Tesla gave away. So the adoption rate for people paying for FSD is below 15%. I think it's 14%. So they've sold 4 million vehicles and let's say 3.5 million had the hardware. So that's Model 3, Model Y, new S and X. So with that adoption rate 
about 3 million of those vehicles are driving around with an extra thousand dollars worth of hardware that's not being utilized. So 3 million times a thousand is what? 3 billion? Yeah. $3 billion of hardware that's just driving around the road, not being used to its capability because uh, it still would need some processing power for your basic safety system. So the thousand dollars is actually a very conservative amount of extra computing power for hardware 2.5, three, and now hardware four. Um, I think it's wild considering how we've worked with traditional OEMs that'll have seven wire harnesses for all the trim levels. You know, you have the base model, you have the LT, you have the LS, you have the high country, and they'll they'll have a, a, a $27 wire harness and a $23 wire harness and a $21 wire harness for all the different modules, for all the different trim levels. They'll, they'll put in so much undue complexity because they don't want to give away two extra dollars worth of wiring in the LT versus the LS. But right. Tesla will give away $1,000 worth of computing power on every vehicle, which then drops the complexity level in the plant down to world-class levels. Because every Model 3 and Model Y all gets the same module, right, yeah. whether or not, because they don't have all the trim levels. So right. plant complexity reduction is something that's oftentimes overlooked, but a low amount of colors and essentially no variability on their builds besides battery pack size and yeah. whether or not you have two motors. It's incredible. Well, here's the thing. That's the Toyota, or sorry, the Honda, Honda. mentality. And uh, yeah, and they, they won, they, they, they beat everybody. And when you tore their cars to pieces, oh, here's a connector that doesn't go anywhere. Here's a connector that doesn't go anywhere. They don't care because they just got rid of several guys on the assembly line. Um, they, they don't have to build as big a plant on and on and on. I mean, people, <laughs> I can't begin to tell you how many folks told me I was full of shit on the, uh, on the casting stuff. Remember that thing's been sitting, uh, they, they went out of business. They're actually in China now. The, uh, the guys that sent me those casting, that, that casting uh, system that they had for, uh, for a skateboard. And they, they took it to China, Chinese got it. So that Sandy, that won't work, that won't work. Now we've got the real numbers. Now, I mean, you take a third a third of the of the body shop disappears and half the people oh oh well we didn't take that in well wait a minute it's made out of aluminum yeah but the scrap rate is like next to nothing when you put scrap and everything else into this and they don't have any how much does that save you well we didn't take into account well then there's the quality a perfect build every time on a casting well that, that doesn't mean anything to us because on and on and on They'll always find the excuse. And that's the big thing I was talking about, that psychological thing, the scotoma. They'll always go and figure out how to block the facts so they can live in whatever the strange world is that they, they live in. Yeah. Well, look, you know, one of the advantages Tesla has is so few models. And so it can really concentrate on one. And, you know, what you see is they introduce new things like castings, when they go to new plants. And so, you know, like the Mexico one, they're going to revolutionize vehicle assembly when yeah. they build that plant. And they're going to have a low cost model in there. The legacies, the, the, they, they got to go with what they got. I mean, you know, if they go out and start building all new plants and, and the like, you know, <clears throat> they, they've just obsoleted this, uh, the sunk cost that they've got and they can't do anything with it. Well, and, and so that's another reason why the legacies, yeah. they don't have a, a fighting chance with the way that Tesla is doing things. It reminds me of the cell phone industry when the app, when the iPhone was launched. I think the big players were Motorola, Nokia. Blackberry. Um, and Blackberry. Blackberry. Physical buttons, flip phones. Right. They were dominating the market for the better part of a decade or even, even longer. My father had a big Motorola, you know, brick phone. <laughs> He was a over the road mechanic and he had all sorts of batteries in his truck and he had that for like a decade. And in a matter of years, the iPhone essentially revolutionized what a cell phone is. And I cannot live 
without my iPhone 14 Pro. Actually, all of our filming is done on iPhones. Every minute of our 50 million views and like half a billion minutes of watch time was filmed on an iPhone because it, an 11 Pro, 12 Pro, 13 Pro, 14 Pro, people are like, wow, the, you know, the colors are so great. Wide color gamut, HDR, great optical image stabilization. This has all been born from an industry that, that you know, the, the old cell phone industry was, was so established and they, they got wiped off the planet. I don't right. think we'll see quite such a dramatic, I'm not saying the OEMs are going to be wiped off the planet, but I think there's going to be casualties, but then there's some people who uh, who did exactly uh, what you were saying, John. Didn't Ford Motor Company go and tear down uh, a facility to put in the Lightning? And didn't they add two ends to it so they can get to 150, maybe 200,000 out of that plant? I mean, if they want to, they can do it. But where are they going to get the investment funds? Who's going to give them that money? Now that you've got a couple of banks failing and um, and the SPACs and everything else, they're all dried up and gone. Where are they going to get that funding? Who's going to give that to them uh, in well, order to make it happen? Well, look, you know, uh, Ford is building that Blue Oval City. It's essentially a brand yeah. new Rouge plant down in Tennessee. Right. It's going to be very vertically integrated. And this is why I'm saying I think maybe – Ford is Ford and Renault. They're the only ones who have carved out all their EV <clears throat> operations, set them up totally separate. Yeah. All the top execs in, in this new Ford Model E, uh, with the exception of one of them, Lisa Drake, none of them have automotive experience. They're all out of Silicon Valley. And so that tells me they have a chance of doing it right. Designing, engineering, manufacturing, all in the same room, designing all at the same time, all reporting to one person. That uh, and and Renault's uh, apparently doing something uh, very similar, carving that off. Mm. But that's why I I think you know, with this technological disruption, just doing a better job of what you've been doing is not going to get the job done. And th th this is one of the flaws of the Toyota production system. When you look at Toyota's uh, or uh, Tesla's new manufacturing process, new assembly process. Toyota has been improving a flawed system. Tesla said, we're not going to try to improve a flawed system. We're going to reinvent it completely right. and take all those inefficiencies out of it. Okay, but and is is it going to do that at every single one of its plants or will it do it going forward? I mean, John, as you said earlier, you know, when they're right. when they're build a new plant, you put in the new casting operation or whatever. So well, so I mean, you'll have Shanghai, you'll have Berlin, <clears throat> you'll have Fremont. Um, are these plants all going to transition to this new modular build or will they continue? What There's no been point. Doing? There, there would be no point in, you know. in continuing it, but everything that they do in the future probably will go in that direction. Now, having said that, I can tell you that uh, the Fremont plant has got the great big giant casting um, things put into their facility. Those big giant casting things will basically take up a small corner of, um, of the body shop and uh, they'll start making things that way. I can tell you for sure because, um, um, well, I, I, know the, I know the casting guys and I know the, all the mold makers and stuff like that that, are, that, are, that, that, that they, they've, they've let me know that almost everybody on the planet is buying those great big casting machines because they figured out, hey, this makes dollars and cents. So let's go in that direction. So can you do it on the hop? Absolutely. The other thing is what happens to old plants? Well, you shut them down or mothball them and call it a day and then have everybody in the city, you know, point at you and say, you bastard, what did you do to us? Well, you can, you have another option. And that is as one product dies off, you can go in there and scrub it clean. And we've done that. We've done that with a, do a, a, a dozens, dozens of different uh, uh, industrial kind of facilities and in, in different industries. Okay, you limp along for a little while, you do build ahead, then you go in and scrap everything out, it's gone. You keep some stuff, okay? So you're still gonna need some stamping dies and still 
still need some stamping machines, keep the good ones. Relay it out and do it again. And it's not that hard. And what you do is you take an old building that, you know, no, everybody's neglected it. Well, once you got everything out, water blast the thing, paint it with this new kinds of paint that stick to everything, put on a new roof, and guess what? You're back in business. Or you can do what they did in uh, at the Rouge for, for Ford and just say, you know what? Um, this had its day, forget it. Bulldoze it. And somehow they still got product out the door, but now they've got a new facility that's actually three times as big as the old um, the old car pl truck plant, and and now you you can you can survive and thrive. That's the kind of stuff. That's the different kind of thinking that you have to have. And again, we get back to why aren't they thinking or doing that? Well, because there's a bunch of old guys that have a certain a view on how things should be done, and that view is old fashioned. And if it's old fashioned and you don't do anything new, you wind up dying. So there will be death. There will be, there is going to be people who are going to disappear. And when they vanish, that might mean there's a plant available that you can refurbish and put another product in. And then you take your old plant and you say, maybe if it's too expensive to refurbish, TTFN, bulldoze it, turn it into, I don't know, a shopping mall or something, and away you go, do it again. And I think, I think, for instance, what was the, the biggest tragedy that ever happened uh, during, the, uh, during the shutdown uh, or during the, the bank meltdown? They tore down the GM truck plant. Wow, I could not believe. When that Pontiac truck plant was torn to pieces, that was a billion two for that paint shop. All of that facility was just absolutely brilliantly done. It all got scrapped. Why? Because the people in Washington had no clue. Well, I just, we'll just get rid of that. A brand new, absolutely brilliant plant went away that now GM could use to, you know, turn into whatever their next generation product is. At the end of the day, you have to start thinking further ahead than the end of your nose. And that's where it's really going to be tough for most of the OEMs. Yeah. Corey, so getting back to, to, to Gary's question, I'd like to get your thoughts too. How do you think Tesla is going to backfill? <clears throat> you know, because even at the, the Master Plan Part 3 day, they they mentioned that they build three different Model Ys. Mm -hmm. The one in Shanghai is different than the one in Berlin mm -hmm. is different than the one in Austin. Yep. How do you think they're going to handle getting everything back to where it's all copacetic? So they've actually set a precedent here. So when Sandy interviewed Elon in January of 2021, he asked a question, hey, are you going to put these giga castings in the Model 3? <clears throat> and his answer was essentially no. So the tooling, the stamping dies, the design of the Model 3 was pretty well established. And they've been manufacturing it from late 2017, 18, 19, 20. And now it's 2021. So we didn't necessarily, you know, believe that. So we bought a 2022, a 2021 Tesla Model 3. Yeah. Got it, looked at it, and lo and behold, it just had it was all stampings. But they did update the uh oh, that bucket. System. The bucket was plastic. Yeah, so that was yeah. it. So they made some <clears throat> improvements, but that core architecture remained the same. So they've shown that once they set out some level of investment for a, a, a model, even though they launched the model Y with these giga castings. They still make the Model 3 today, all stampings. So they have stuck it out. Now, I think they're working on a new Model 3 and that they've shown some being driven around with camo. I think that may be, it's taken them seven years, essentially, mm -hmm. six years. Probably the end of this year, they may finally launch a Model 3 with some giga castings. So I think you'll find a similar timeline. So if they finally launch, this these this low cost vehicle with this crazy build, you know, modular build, that's a bigger plant tear up than replacing stampings with castings. Right. right. So I think you'll still see 
anywhere from seven to 10 years of build out of Model Ys in Shanghai, Giga Berlin, and Texas as is, including the Cybertruck, however they're building the Cybertruck. And then it won't be until you have a generational change. You have a new generation right. of Model yeah. Y and potentially a new plant where they'll change what it looks like, or maybe they'll make a three row off-road SUV, like a Kia EV9 or a you know Grand Cherokee Explorer size. Right. You may see them with a new plant and a new vehicle go that way yeah. before. So I still think there's too much sunk cost and tooling and design and validation for them to make a monumental change quickly. It's not a bad thing, right. uh, but I just Hey, look, they're making money and they're, they're selling the product, you know, so yeah. they, they can yeah. keep doing things like, like they're doing right now. Yeah. Well, they also, they've also seen a drop in the Model 3. Uh, the Model Y basically cannibalized a lot of the sales that they would have got out of a Model 3. And so I think that um, the Model 3 will be something that uh, once it gets into a lower volume, eaten up by what's going on with Model Y, uh, eventually they'll they'll come up with something new or something different. But it's why bother right now? Not I mean they're dominating the marketplace. Uh, they they can't build cars fast enough. I think they got like a half an hour of of uh, a backlog that's about it i mean they they seem to be able to sell anything they can push out the door yeah but i i think that i think that they're like corey said there's going to be some new product that'll take the place of the model three not sure what but pretty sure that it's going to be um something worthwhile hey, hey sandy we forgot the most important thing to bring up uh Auto line passed a hundred thousand subscribers. John, what do you got to show us? Yeah. <laughs> Look, we got the plaque oh, from very uh, good. There yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. And a and a very nice personal letter. And I know you guys have gotten it too from the CEO of YouTube. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I like what uh, uh, what she said here. She said, if every one of your viewers represented a light year, it would stretch across the Milky Way. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So you, wow, you, you guys with your viewers could, you know, wrap it up th three times. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I actually don't know uh, what uh, what that number would be. But but anyway, I'm congratulations to you, uh, John. This excellent, excellent news. I, I did not know. Yeah. I'm kept in the dark about all these important <laughs> things. I, I feel thanks for bringing that up, Corey. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, look, no, we, and, I, and once again, you were an inspiration for us even starting yes. our own channel. And I remember talking to you because you were in our building right before the pandemic. And I think I filmed for you a little clip you did of right. Sandy and the model right. Model Y. Yeah. Right. And after I did that, it's like, well, I can do this. You know, it's, well, how hard can yeah. it be? You know, just got to edit <laughs> some videos, whatever. Yeah. And I told you and I also told uh, David Welch from Bloomberg and um david tracy from jalopnik because all three of you came in in like two day period i said hey can you can you just mention we're starting a channel and all of you were really kind said, yeah no problem we'll mention it and then it, it took off like a rocket ship we yeah, got like yeah. forty thousand subscribers in like three weeks yeah. you know and uh now sandy's he gets recognized in airports. Like yeah, well, look, you yeah. guys deservedly have gotten the giant audience that you have because you're doing something nobody else is doing mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, your teardowns, your insights, you know, uh, the programs that you do, the multiple different uh, videos that you put out. Nobody has that content. I mean, no one. Yeah. Thanks. Well, well thank you very much. It's very humbling to hear this, uh, this praise. And, um, and quite frankly, John, I've always looked up to you. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you're, uh, uh, you were the, you are the voice of, uh, of Detroit and, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, and everybody knows who you are. Um, I might get recognized by, by, uh, people in an airport or something, but the real people who, uh, who run the automotive world, everybody knows who John McElroy is. Not so many of them know who, Corey and Sandy is so yeah and well, Gary you're you're all right too yeah <laughs> yeah oh yeah oh Gary oh yeah sorry yeah there we we forgot about Gary 
Everybody knows Gary Vasilash. Hey guys, I, 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 we should probably wrap it up here. You've been extraordinarily generous with your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, let's keep doing this because this yeah. was a great conversation. You know, I'm sure the audience appreciated, you know, uh, how much insight, how many facts and all that came out of this. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. It's very yeah. kind of you to do that. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. And thank everybody for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. If you like this program and would like to learn more about the automotive industry, check out our website at Autoline.tv or look for us on YouTube on the Autoline channel.